Welcome to lab 15. So in this lab, we're gonna cover our australopithecines and the early members of the genus Homo. The first thing we're gonna look at right now is a picture, if I can get it. There we go, this is Donald Johansson. So him and his colleagues were the ones who found the famous Lucy specimen and they found her quite unexpectedly. And so here's the skeletal remains all laid out of what we have of Lucy. And we'll talk a little bit about Lucy later on in this lecture. Overall, the Australopithecines are members um, uh, they're of this genus. There are all these in individual remains that we have and that we have categorized into were a group of ancestors that lived anywhere between four to one million years ago. Um, we have recovered numerous uh, skeletal remains from numerous sites in Eastern and Southern Africa. And all of these species that we have discovered were habitual bipeds. They varied mostly in size and robusticity with some species that were smaller and more gracile and then other species that were larger and more robust. As a group, they generally had a much smaller cranial capacity and body size than more modern humans do. They had small canines, large premolars, and larger large molars. With our later robust australopithecines, because the australopithecines are split into, we have our earlier more gracile and then we have later more robust um, australopithecines. Um, sometimes we'll call them paranthropists to, to differentiate them out in their own genus. Um, those more robust uh, paranthropist specimens have notably larger faces, jaws, and teeth. So um, the earliest australopithecine that we have discovered thus far is Australopithecus anamensis. Um, <coughs> sorry. Anamensis lived around 4 million years ago in Eastern Africa. It had a number of primitive ape-like traits. You can see it here displayed in the teeth, right? They had very large canines, a parallel upper tooth row. They had asymmetrical lower premolars with outer cusps that were much larger than the inner cusps. Our postcranial remains of the specimen do indicate that it was a habitual biped with some adaptations for walking on two feet. There are enough similarities between Australopithecus anamensis and the earlier Ardipithecus specimens to suggest that they might have directly related in an ancestor-descendant-like relationship. The combination of our ancestral ape-like traits and the more derived Australopithecine-like traits that we see in Australopithecus anamensis has been interpreted as evidence that Australopithecus anamensis was the first Australopithecine and may have been ancestral to our later Australopithecine species. So that's Australopithecus anamensis. Next up, we have Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, Australopithecus afarensis lived 3.6 to 3 million years ago in Eastern Africa. Another early Australopithecine um, is this one. And so um, with Australopith Australopithecus afarensis, we find that they had relatively small cranial capacities of 350 to 500 cc's, which is similar to our living non-human apes. <laughs> One of the, the things that you'll see as we continue to our more newer specimens is that that cranial capacity is going to slowly start to increase until you get to uh, the Neanderthals, which are very large, or and us humans. Um, in many other features, Australopithecus uh, afarensis appears to have been intermediate between a living chimpanzee and a living human. So their faces were more pronathic than a human face, but they were flatter than a chimpanzee face. And then their canine teeth were larger than human canines. So they were kind of intermediate between the two. Australopithecus afarensis has many similarities to Australopithecus anamensis, and it suggests again that they, have a they share a direct ancestor-descendant relationship. In some features, Australopithecus afarensis appears less primitive than, in Aus than Australopithecus anamensis. So an example is the cusps of its lower premolars, right? They are relatively equal in size and the upper tooth rows have an arch shape like in humans as opposed to the parallel rows seen in Australopithecus anamensis and our non-human apes. 
Australopithecus afarensis seems to have had a broader diet than Anamensis, whose diet was whose diet more closely resembles that of a modern chimpanzee living in a savanna habitat. So Afarensis had a more broader diet than Anamensis did. Researchers who conducted carbon isotope analysis to examine chemical traces in fossil teeth have found evidence that Australopithecus afarensis had a very broad diet that probably incorporated a wider range of plants than the diet of living chimpanzees do. And then Australopithecus afarensis is best is the best known Australopithecine. It's represented by dozens of individuals. However, the most famous specimen of Australopithecus afarensis is Lucy. So the remains of Lucy and our other Australopithecus afarensis individuals tells us a lot about their postcranial traits. We know that these Australopithecines had angled femurs. They also had pelvises that were short and broad, although not as bowl shaped as the pelvises of humans. So just with that angled femur, we now have evidence for bipedal locomotion. We also have the Laetoli footprints. Uh, they were left by members of the species and they indicate that Australopithecus afarensis had slightly divergent big toes and arched feet. These features, the lower body, indicate it was bipedal, but the features that we find in the upper body also indicate that it had adaptations for arboreal locomotion. So within afarensis, we see that they had long forearms and curved fingers, which again, it is indica indicative of arboreal locomotion. Lucy is estimated to have been on the smaller side. So her skeletal remains measure at three and a half feet or about a meter tall. But we have other fossils, particularly the male individuals who are estimated to have been as much as a foot and a half or two feet taller than Lucy. So uh, about five feet and to five six um, is what we're looking at. The level of sexual dimorphism found in many regions of the Australopithecus afarensis skeleton is similar to what we see in living chimpanzees and gorillas. Some researchers take that and suggest that this evidence indicates that Australopithecus afarensis might have had a polygynous social structure. However, Australopithecus afarensis had smaller canines similar to those in our pre-Australopithecines like Ardipithecus, which suggests that they experienced less male-male competition than living apes with polygynous social structures. Again, it's a hypothetical because we cannot directly observe Australopithecus afarensis to confirm the social structure it had, but the degrees of sexual dimorphism are enough that it allows some researchers to make those um, hypothesis of the social structure. So we've covered Australopithecus anamensis, we've covered Australopithecus afarensis, and now we're going to cover Australopithecus africanus. So Australopithecus africanus was first identified by Raymond Dart in the 1920s. Um, this makes it the first Australopithecine species to be discovered. Uh, Africanus lived around three to two million years ago in southern Africa. Compared with our earlier Australopithecus afarensis species, Australopithecus africanus had a slightly larger cranial capacity of 450 to 550 cc's. This is slightly smaller incisors and canines, slightly larger premolars and molars, and a slightly flatter face. Despite those differences, a carbon isotope evidence suggests that Australopithecus africanus had a diverse diet similar to that of Australopithecus afarensis. Our postcranial traits, um, the short, broad pelvis, long arms, show that they had a mix of bipedal and arboreal adaptations similar to what we see in afarensis. The two species seem to have had similar body sizes and similar degrees of sexual dimorphism. Um, but there, there isn't, there is, there is a lot of information on Africanus, especially the fact that it was one of the, or it was the earliest specimen of Australopithecines to be discovered. Um, for now, though, just focus on this. Um, you know, slightly larger cranial capacity. Um, smaller incisors and canines, slightly larger premolars and molars, and a slightly flatter face. Those are 
um, key differences between Africanus um, and Afarensis. Um, next, we have Australopithecus gari. Um, so we have just really quick recap. Um, we had Anamensis, Afarensis, Africanus. So those three are easy to get confused with one another. And then we have Australopithecus gari. Um, around the same time that Australopithecus africanus was living in southern Africa, Australopithecus gari was living in eastern Africa. So we do have evidence that shows that certain species lived in different parts of Africa at the same time. Um, like then here's one of them, right? Australopithecus gari existed at the same time as Australopithecus africanus. This was about 2.5 million years ago. Australopithecus gari was living in Eastern Africa. Um, and like our previous Australopithecines, they had a small cranial capacity of 450 cc's and a pronathic face. We also see that Australopithecus gari had a small sagittal crest. So it's a huge difference with our Australopithecus anamensis, afarensis, and africanus. Although we will see in, in, uh, in other 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 specimens that they have sagittal crests, but this is the first one we're discussing. Uh, in contrast to earlier Australopithecines, Australopithecus gari had larger canines, premolars, and molar teeth. Based on the evidence available, it seems to have had longer legs than the earlier Australopithecines, potentially indicating a more bipedal lifestyle with less use of arboreal locomotion, but we need more postcranial evidence before a definitive interpretation can be made. The anatomical features seen and its date of 2.5 million years ago have led some researchers to suggest that this species was ancestral to the early Homo species that followed. What's most interesting of Australopithecus gari is its suggested behavior. So, Recent evidence from Ethiopia indicates that Australopithecus gari might have produced and used the first stone tools. Animal bones with cut marks have been found at Australopithecus gari sites in the middle of Wash region of Ethiopia. The cut marks can only have been made by stone tools and they suggest that Australopithecus gari was using stone tools to butcher animals. Stone tools recovered from another site in the Gona area of Ethiopia date to around 2.5 million years ago, which is the time when Australopithecus gari occupied the area. However, the tools were not found at the same site as Australopithecus gari fossils. Um, and that's where there's like a little bit of confusion, right? So the, the fossils were not found next to the stone tools, but the stone tools also date to around the same time in the similar region of, of where we find Australopithecus gari. So it's that connection that they're using to suggest that they might have been the first stone tool users. Um, one thing to remember is that prior to this discovery, it was previously believed that stone tool production was limited to members of our genus Homo. So these findings, um, they're not just kind of whatever findings, they are findings that revolutionize our understanding of tool use in the human lineage. Um, additional stone tools and animal bones with cut marks have been found at even earlier sites in Eastern Africa. So paleoanthropologists at the Lomekwi site in, in West Turkana, Kenya, they unearthed numerous stone tools that date to around 3.3 million years ago that could have been used to butcher, uh, to butcher and process animal meat and bone marrow for food. Um, the Dikika site has animal bones with possible cut marks dating to 3.3 million years ago. Um, and so what this mounting evidence suggests is that an even earlier Australopith species might have been making and using stone tools as well. We just haven't found the actual stone tools, but it's, it is highly possible that an earlier Australopith species could have been using stone tools that even predates Australopith Australopithecus gari. For now though, um, Australopithecus gari is what we consider the earliest stone tool user until further evidence is discovered. Um, these early stone tools are considered to be part of the Oldowan technology. Most Oldowan tools are either choppers or flakes. And so choppers are large, heavy tools that have a sharp edge where smaller bits of rock 
have been broken off. And then the flakes are these smaller bits of rock that are removed from choppers. The size and the weight of the choppers make them well suited for chopping tasks, such as chopping up the long bones of animals to extract the marrow inside. In contrast, these smaller flakes have delicate sharp surfaces that are well suited to fine cutting tasks such as cutting animal meat off the bone. Producing these tools involves a relatively simple per process of direct percussion. Uh, direct percussion is where two stones are hit directly together to break off the flakes. The tools are generalized so that they can be used for a variety of tasks and they vary considerably in size, shape, and raw material. We'll go over Oldowan tool technology a little bit more um, as we continue. Mm -hmm. The next Australopithecus uh, species that we're looking at is Australopithecus sediba. Australopithecus sediba was discovered in 2010 and it dates to around 2 million years ago. Uh, this is a contemporary of Australopithecus robustus, um, which we'll talk about later. Its cranial features were more similar to those of Australopithecus africanus. It had a small cranial capacity of 420 cc's, a small overall body size, long arms for arboreal locomotion, um, and many of these features suggest that Australopithecus sediba may have descended from Australopithecus africanus. Um, Australopithecus sediba, though, shares several features in common with members of our own Homo genus. One example being that Australopithecus sediba had smaller teeth mandibles and zygomatic arches in most australopithecines. Um, we also see that australopithecus sediba had a broad pelvis similar to that which we see in our early members of the homo genus. So these are our early australopithecines. Um, you can call them the more gracile ones and then we're gonna, I split this up between those and our robust australopithecines, the ones that we would consider, some consider in their own genus as paranthropus. So here's just a a side by side view um, where you can look between the two, this the grass eye australopithecines and our robust australopithecines. We see that our grass eye ones usually have no sagittal crest. Uh, their zygomatic arches and mandible are smaller, and their molar teeth are smaller. Um, with our robust australopithecines, we do see a sagittal crest in a few of them. There's an increase in overall size of the zygomatic arches in the mandible and an increase in size of the molar teeth. So paranthropus are just the robust australopithecines. And you can put paranthropus or you can put australopithecus um, when you're writing it down. It doesn't matter to me. Um, just as long as you're able to identify between which ones are gracile and which ones are robust. Our Australopithecus or Paranthropus Ethiopicus is the first one. Um, and Ethiopicus existed around 2.5 million years ago. This is the same time that Australopithecus africanus was in Southern Africa and Australopithecus gari was in Eastern Africa. So this individual or this species um, existed in Western Africa. Western Africa? Let me double check that. Sorry, Eastern Africa. So it's a contemporary for those species, our Australopithecus africanus um, and Australopithecus gari. Australopithecus ethiopicus had a cranial capacity of 410 cc's, which is similar to that of our earlier Australopithecines. Um, several of its cranial features, though, were very different. Like I said, we did have, have one species that had a sagittal crest before. Now we have another one, so Australopithecus ethiopicus. So Australopithecus ethiopicus was similar to that of the earlier Australopithecines, but several of its cranial features were very different. Um, it's the earliest robust australopithecine form known, and it shows the classic cranial and dental trace that we see in robust australopithecines. Um, we see that they had this, yeah, they had smaller front teeth, but larger premolars and molars than we find in our gracile australopithecines. They had a large sagittal crest, a large mandible, large zygomatic arches, which made its face seem wide and flared. If you look at the image here, like 
this is not telling you exactly which one it is, but the faces do seem whiter and more flared just overall. These enlarged features indicate that Australopithecus ethiopicus had a diet that required a lot of heavy chewing. And it's not clear whether or not this early robust form evolved into the later robust Australopithecus boisei and Australopithecus robustus species. So here you can see is a side-by-side -side, uh, view between the robust and the grassa Australopithecines, right? We have Australopithecus or Paranthropus ethiopicus and Australopithecus africanus. Right, no crest here, but a sagittal crest here in the males. Zygomatic arches are wider here. They're more narrow here. And you can see it from the top. And then more pronathic here. We actually do have this specimen, like a model of it in the lab. Um, but of course, in the online setting, we can't really see them in person. Mm -hmm. Next is Australopithecus boisei. Um, Australopithecus boisei lived 2.3 and 1.2 million years ago in Eastern Africa. They had a slightly larger cranial capacity with 510 cc's than Australopithecus ethiopicus did. Their cranial and dental features suggest a specialized heavy chewing diet. So again, we've got a central crest, large zygomatic arches, and very large back teeth. Among the robust Australopithecines, Australopithecus boisei was a particularly robust species. It had large, the largest molars of them all. Carbon isotope studies suggest some robust Australopithecines may have had a broader diet that was more similar to those of our earlier Australopithecines than previously expected. This carbon isotope analysis indicates then that Australopithecus boisei differed from those other Australopithecines and had a diet that more, was more narrowly focused on the sedges and grasses. So that's on one difference between our Australopithecus boisei and our other robust Paranthropus species. Then we have Australopithecus robustus named for its robusticity. It lived in Southern Africa around two to 1.5 million years ago and was contemporaneous with Australopithecus boisei in Eastern Africa. Australopithecus robustus had a small cranial capacity, um, averaging anywhere between 410 to 530 cc's. They had traits that were adapted for heavy chewing, like the large molars, large zygomatic arches, large sagittal crests, um, and Robustus had a broader diet than Boy's Eye did. So there we have our robust Australopithecines. Just again, looking at the increase, the, the brain size, right? The brain between our late Australopithecines and our early Homo species, they are smaller, right? So late Australopithecines are smaller than the early Homo species. We do see a reduction in size and the teeth also reduce in size as well. Then we have a few that kind of don't fit in or just one that doesn't fit in. It's just it's a more recent discovery. So in 2015, researchers led by Johannes Haile Selassie announced the discovery of a new Australopith that lived in Eastern Africa at the same time as Australopithecus afarensis. And this is 3.5 to 3.3 million years ago. And this a uh, new species was named Australopithecus deuremida. So Australopithecus deuremida, uh, meaning close relative, um, was in the local of, uh, sorry, was found in the Afar region of Ethiopia. And so what it means is close relative in that in the local Afar language. Um, this name was chosen because Australopithecus deuremida was probably a close relative of the contemporaneous Australopithecus afarensis that ha was found in the same region. Uh, it's represented by several fossilized jaw fragments and teeth. Uh, the back teeth we find are larger and the front teeth are smaller than those of our Australopithecus afarensis species. We also see that they had larger jaws overall, which indicates a greater emphasis on chewing and perhaps a, on diet then that's slightly different than that of our Australopithecus afarensis. So this is a fairly recent uh, discovery that we've had. 
So next we're gonna move on to the genus Homo. Um, for today we are only gonna, for this lab lecture, we're gonna only cover uh, Homo habilis. In the, next, in the next lecture video, we're gonna cover the rest of the genus Homo. So the genus Homo existed from 2.5 to 1.8 million years ago. Um, we had them living side by side with our robust Australopithecines in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, this is the first member of our own genus, which is Homo habilis. Homo habilis had a much smaller chewing complex and a larger brain size. The name itself, Homo habilis, means handy man, and it's the result of its discovery with associated stone tools. At this time of the discovery, tool use was believed to be limited to our genus, and Homo habilis then was thought to have been the first stone tool user. But as we've previously discussed, the finding of stone tools in the Gona area that date to around 2.5 million years ago suggests that Australopithecus gari may have been one of the first stone tool users. So when this discovery was made, it was just the assumption that Homo habilis was the first stone tool user. It wasn't until recent discoveries um, that indicate Australopithecus gari was the first stone tool user. So Homo habilis was probably a habitual biped. It had a short stature, relatively long arms, and hands that were suitable for climbing. Some re researchers question the limb proportion estimates for Homo habilis, and they argue that it was an early obligate biped due to its lack of an opposable hallux and the presence of a longitudinal arch in its foot. Compared to Australopithecines, Homo habilis had a slightly larger cranial capacity of 650 cc's and a more gracile cranial and dental features. So you can see they had slightly larger cranial capacities right here, smaller zygomatic arches, and smaller teeth overall. And you can see that the brain size has already almost doubled since we first started. Homo habilis had smaller teeth, mandibles, and zygomatic arches, and it lacked a sagittal crest, which is typical of our robust Australopithecines. It seems that there was a fair amount of variation within this group. Some individuals had larger cranial capacities and slightly more robust cranial features and teeth. Other individuals had smaller cranial capacities, which are more similar to our Australopithecines, and more gracile cranial features and teeth. Some researchers believe that this variation reflects minor differences due to sexual dimorphism with the robust individuals being male and more gracile individuals being female. So um, we'll see this ha happen a few times with uh, uh, other species where researchers don't agree on where to put them, right? Are they just, you know, evidence of sexual dimorphism or should they be in their own separate group? Um, and so we see that happen pretty, pretty frequently. These researchers who believe that it's just a result of sexual dimorphism classify all of the individuals into the same single species of Homo habilis. Other researchers argue that the differences are more significant and they warrant a separation of the group into two distinct species, or Homo habilis being the smaller ones and Homo rudolfensis being the larger ones. So research that was conducted in 2012 reported evidence that has been has further bolstered that latter view that they should be their own separate species of Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. There was new specimens found in the Kubifora Kenya region that are anatomically similar to our much larger individuals classified as Homo rudolfensis, but they are much smaller, which, it, which then indicates that the large size alone is not responsible for the distinctive features that we see in Homo rudolfensis. So what this suggests is that there are two distinct clusters of ho early Homo fossils that reflect two distinct species, Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. The anatomical traits that we see in Homo habilis suggest that it had a more diverse diet, particularly compared to the diet of our late Australopithecines. This dietary diversity is confirmed by carbon isotope evidence that shows that early Homo individuals incorporated a wider range of plants into their diet than the more grass-focused Australopithecus boisei individuals. While the robust forms like Australopithecus boisei were very well adapted for chewing abrasive grassy diets during that grassland expansion across East Africa that started 3 million years ago, Early Homo was perhaps better adapted for a flexible diet that accommodated fluctuating climates and landscapes. 
So while we don't know precisely what all our early ancestors were eating, it is clear which dietary adaptations were ultimately the more successful ones. So those were that are for a more generalized diet, which modern humans possess today, were more successful. These earliest members of our genus Homo mark the beginning of a shift towards more human-like traits, particularly bigger brains and smaller faces, and the use of stone tools. This shift becomes even more dramatic in the next species in the Homo lineage, which is Homo erectus, but we'll cover that one in lab 16. Um, I end this lecture and I also end the next lecture with a um, timeline that shows the Australopithecines and our early Homo species side by side to see where they lived and you know, you know, the time period they lived. Because what I, when I was first taking physical anthropology or probably prior to it I just assumed that one species lived it died out the next species lived and died out I didn't realize that they coexisted or they were contemporaneous to one another and so this this timeline really helps put that into perspective it splits apart eastern Africa and southern Africa and then it gives you the time frame um, so Australopithecus anamensis was pretty much on its own but Afarensis de Eremita, right, they lived contemporaneously in Eastern Africa. Um, Africanus lives contemporaneously with Homo habilis rudolfensis, Paranthropus boisei, Paranthropus, Paranthropus ethiopicus, and Australopithecus gari, as well as Homo habilis rudolfensis in uh, Southern Africa, and a little bit of Australopithecus sediba, right? So you can really see where and how they overlap one another. All right, so that's the end of this lab, lab 15. The next lab will cover the later members of the genus Homo all the way to modern humans.